Hello students, good afternoon. I'm Professor Henderson and today we will be discussing the chapter, chapter 42 on uh, fluid and electrolyte imbalance. So as always, we start out the lesson plan by having the student learning objectives. So here are the objectives for this lesson plan. Upon completion of this lecture, students will be able to um, describe the process involving electrolyte balance, identify risk factors for fluid and electrolyte balance, apply the nursing process when caring for a patient with electrolyte imbalance, describe the steps of blood transfusion reactions and nursing interventions, discuss how to maintain and manage a transfusion reaction, Describe the complications associated with intravenous therapy. Discuss the normal electrolyte values. Discuss various types of solutions such as isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. Discuss in which situation the nurse will hang an isotonic versus a hypertonic solution. So here are the different types of IV solutions we have here. So as you can see, the first solution that we have is the isotonic solution. So isotonic solutions is, um, has the same, the cell, the solution has the same concentration as your cell in your body. So the concentration of the isotonic has the same concentration of your extracellular fluid in your body. So let's say in what situation you think the doctor may order an isotonic solution. So let's say you have a patient that comes in and the patient has been um, having nausea and vomiting and diarrhea times three days. So you might anticipate that the doctor may order an isotonic solution for this patient secondary to um, dehydration. So the next example we have here of a, a hypertonic solutions, as you can see, 3% saline, 5% saline, and 5% dextrose and lactate ringer. So with the hypertonic solution, you have to um, know which situation you would hang an hypertonic solution because with an hypertonic solution, that's when the cell shrinks. So let's say a patient comes into the emergency room and they have edema. Let's say they have bilateral lower extremity plus three pitting edema. And maybe their blood work shows that they have um, CHF, congested heart failure. They might be a candidate for a hypertonic solution. And the rationale for that, hanging a hypertonic solution with this patient is that it's going to shift fluid out of the extracellular space into the vein into the vein so it can be filtered out by the kidney. That's the main rationale why you hang in a hypertonic solution for a patient with CHF is to, um, is to um, shift that fluid from the out of the extracellular space into the vein so it could be filtered out by the kidney. Another example is a hypotonic solution. A hypotonic, the, these are the um, different concentration of the hypotonic solution. 0 0.2, 2, 5, saline, 0 0.45, 0 0.33. But um, the most important thing to know with the hypotonic solution is what type of situation you will hang a hypotonic solution. Let's say you have a patient comes in with DKA or a patient comes in with hyperosmolality or a patient with hyperglycemia. They might be candidates for a hypotonic solution. So the doctor may order a hypotonic solution. So one thing to remember about the hypotonic solution, 
you never hang a hypotonic solution with a person who is at risk with head trauma that are at risk for increased ICP, intracranial pressure. It's contraindicated to hang a hypotonic solution. Now let's look at the um, normal acid base band. These are all the different values for normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45, normal PCO2 35 to 45, PaO2 80 to 100, O2 saturation 95 to 100, HCO3 by carb 22 to 26, and we have our sodium is 136 to 145. Our potassium is 3.5 to 5. Our chloride is 98 to 106. Total CO2 is 22 to 30. And total calcium is 8.4 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. So these values were um, in your Cotter and Perry textbook. So please... Um, be sure to refer to your Cotter and Perry textbook for these um, values with normal acid-base values. So now I want to talk a little bit about the different types of hormone that um, regulates fluid and electrolyte imbalance. So there are three types of hormone here, and um, it, your, your textbook did a pretty good, good job in these. So please um, refer to your Potter and Perry textbook again. So we have the antidiuretic hormone or the ADH. So ADH is a hormone that is um, released by the posterior pituitary gland. And it regulates osmolality of body fluid by regulating how much water is excreted in the urine. So it's important that you know the function of ADH. ADH um, is the reabsorption of water, taking water from the renal tubule into the blood. So factors, factors that may alter or influence ADH level is dehydration, also hypovolemia. If you're in hypovolemic shock or you're dehydrated, your ADH level will be increased. Another hormone that we'll talk about is the RAS system or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So the RAS system regulates sodium and water excreted in the urine. And... So this system, there are specialized cells in the kidney. And these specialized cells in the kidney releases renin. And renin is an enzyme that acts on the angiotensin system. So renin converts angiotensin 1, which then converts to angiotensin 2 by, by an enzyme in the lung thereby regulating your um regulating your blood pressure and your sodium and water excretion in the urine so another hormone is the atrial natural natural peptide hormone and this hormone regulates your extracellular fluid volume how much sodium and water is excreted into the urine so um, the ANP, there are specialized cells in the heart that releases ANP, and ANP inhibits ADH by increasing the loss of sodium and water in the urine. So we know our thirst is regulated. Um, it's in, the thirst is regulated by your um, within your hypothalamus, and you know um, the very young and the very elderly are more at risk for dehydration because the elderly, some of them may have um, cognitive impairments such as Alzheimer's or dementia, and they're not able to remember that they're thirsty and they might be at more risk for dehydration. 
So let's talk a little bit about potassium. So we know potassium is a very, very important electrolyte. And what are some of the functions of potassium? So we know potassium regulates our what? It regulates our um, muscle contractibility. It also regulates your heartbeat and it re regulates your um, fluid and electrolytes. So if someone potassium, the normal potassium is 3.5 to 5. So if someone comes in with hyperkalemia, so they might be exhibiting um, muscle weakness. They might be having cardiac dysrhythmias. And even they can go into cardiac arrest because one of the function of potassium is to regulate the heartbeat. So what are some treatments that the doctor may order? Of course, we know they're going to be placed on a cardiac monitor and um, they'll be giving um, IV regular insulin, IV sodium bicarb and KXLate to lower their potassium level. So these are some um, EK ECG abnormal abnormalities that you may see on the cardiac monitor they might throw a peak in the t wave and a widening qrs complex and a prolongation of the prn intervals so text question you can read this and we already talked about the different types of hormone the adh the ras system and the amp hormone so we have your fluid balance. So our fluid intake, our thirst should be about, our thirst regulates fluid intake. It should be around 2,300 mLs per day. But we know that is also contraindicated in certain conditions like patients with CHF or patients with end-stage renal disease that is unable to excrete and manage fluids. So they might require to be um, on a 1,000 patients with renal impairment might be required to be on a thousand mls of fluid per day so the fluid distribution we know fluids are um, extracellular and intracellular extracellular fluids outside of the cell intracellular fluid inside the cell and we talked about the the influence of um, these different types of hormone and how it regulates fluid and electrolyte balance. So we know um, fluid output, we can lose fluids through our kidney, through our skin, through our lungs, and through our GI tract. And there is um, insensible loss and also sensible loss. So with, um, with sensible loss is something that you can actually measure. So let's say sensible loss, if you measure someone urine output, that might be an example of a sensible loss because you can measure it. Insensible loss is water that is passed through the skin and is lost through evaporization. I have another NCLEX style question here. You can look at it. Um, not difficult and these are the different types of um, solutions the extracellular fluid and the osmolality so um let's talk a little bit about osmolality and what is os what is osmolality so osmo osmolality is the um amount of um, particles particles that um in your fluids the amount of particles in the fluid is osmolality and hypernatremia is water deficit so hypernatremia is when your sodium level is elevated and it's greater than 145 so sodium is elevated and water, total body water is decreased. So that's hyponatremia. So what are some signs and symptoms you may see with patients with um, hyponatremia? A lot of them is related to the central nervous system due to the brain shrinking. 
you might see confusion you might see out of mental status you might 